there's an Irish blessing which I really like. There's lots of Irish blessings, aren't there? And the one that I really like goes, May the roof above us never fall in, and may the friends gathered below never fall out. Well, it's a bit of a strange one for us at the minute because we're all locked in our own homes and we hope the roofs don't fall in. But we don't have any friends in our homes, do we? Other than our family, of course. But blessings are an important part of who we are as Christians. We want to bless one another and we pray for God's blessing, don't we? At a baptism service, many congregations will sing the ironic blessing, an, an ancient prayer, an ancient blessing of the church coming from the, the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. As a congregation, we essentially join together to ask for God's blessing upon the person being baptised. And that is our desire as the church, isn't it? That the Lord would bless and keep our baptised members. In our Christian lives, we often pray for blessing. You've probably prayed it yourself. But have you ever wondered what it actually looks like? What does it actually mean to be blessed by God? And what about sin? What about our sinfulness? Does our sin inhibit God's blessing? Does God withdraw his blessing from those who are in sin? We all struggle with sin, don't we? From day to day, we always tell ourselves we'll be better tomorrow. We're sure that we can have the willpower to avoid sin tomorrow. We think that maybe God will bless me tomorrow. Maybe if I keep from sin, God will bless me. If only I can behave correctly. I wonder if any of you have ever thought that way. Well, the Bible has good news for sinners. It has good news for sinners who want to be blessed by God. And it has a word for you today from Psalm chapter 1. That the blessing of God might not come in the way that you expect it. Psalm 1 is the introduction to the book of Psalms. It's important that we read Psalm 1 first, basically. It sets the tone for the rest of the book. This is a book which John Calvin said reflects every experience of the human heart. If you're ever struggling to put your own feelings into words, in prayer especially, then turning to the Psalms can help. It will give you words to express how you feel before God. Psalm 1 begins with the word blessed. And so the whole book of Psalms begins with this word blessed and tells us about a blessed man. It describes this man in three ways. Firstly, it describes him negatively, the things that he does not do. Then positively, the things that he does do. And then thirdly, metaphorically, it gives us an illustration about what the man is like. And so firstly, what is the blessed man not like? Well, you can see in verse 1 that he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. The blessed man avoids the influence of sin upon his life. He doesn't listen to the advice that comes from the world. He doesn't do the things that the world does. He's not like the world at all. He doesn't act the way of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. There's a poetic movement in this psalm, isn't there, from, from walking to standing to sitting. Listening to the advice of the wicked leads to acting in the way of sinners, and soon enough, sitting in the seat of scoffers or mockers. Walking, standing, leads to sitting. In the same way, listening to advice leads to acting a certain way, which in turn changes who you are. Eventually, you don't just act like a mocker, you become a mocker. But the blessed man doesn't do any of this. Verse 2 tells us his delight is in the law of the Lord. Rather than listening to the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly, the blessed man follows the advice that comes from God. 
The word law here might be better translated as teaching. He delights in the teaching of the law of the Lord. He meditates on the teaching day and night. This phrase day and night used to, to tell us that he thinks about and he mulls over the Lord's teaching constantly, day and night, always. And then we come to verse 3, and the blessed man is described as a tree. This is not an ordinary tree, it's planted by streams of water. And so we see this picture of strength and vitality in the tree. It yields its fruit in season, its leaves do not wither. This man is strong and unshakable. He is the perfect tree, standing strong and firm, giving the right fruit at the right time and always having green leaves, always full of life. Summed up by what the psalmist then says, in all that he does, he prospers. Whatever he does shall prosper. Now, if that's where I left you today, then you would probably be thinking, well, now I know, now I know how to be blessed. I need to stop hanging out with sinners. I need to read my Bible more and spend my time in church. I need to have really good, quiet times. Then I will be blessed. But these three verses are not a set of instructions. They're not a set of instructions on how to become blessed. They're a description of the blessed man. And you are not the blessed man or the blessed woman of Psalm 1. Did you think that you were the blessed man? You're not. As lovely as you all are, you're not like this tree. No matter how much you read your Bible, you don't prosper in all that you do. How many of us can honestly say that we do the things that this blessed man does? How many of us would be willing to raise our hand and say, I delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night? It never gets boring. I never miss a day reading the Bible. I never do it out of obligation. I always do it out of delight. We are not the blessed man. In fact, there's only one blessed man. Look at the language that the psalmist uses. The man is singular. Blessed is the man. This psalm describes a person, a single person. Not a metaphorical person, but a literal, actual person. And it contrasts this person against a whole group of people. It's the blessed man versus the wicked people. So if we're assigning roles to ourselves in this psalm, well, we're the wicked. We're certainly not like the man in the first three verses, so we must be the wicked, the ungodly. That's what's communicated by the not so of verse four. This is the opposite of who the blessed man is. And just look what it says about the ungodly. The ungodly are like chaff which the wind drives away. They are useless, utterly and completely useless. The psalmist has spent three verses and 11 lines describing the characteristics of the blessed man. But only one verse describing the ungodly. It's as if he's saying the ungodly, well, they're not even worth talking about. Friends, it all comes back to the way that we read our Bibles. I hope you realise by now that we're not to read the Bible as if it's about us and what we should do. We read our Bibles about Jesus. The Bible is all about Jesus and what he has done. You know, we often think the problem is out there in the world. The solution is in here in the church. But in reality, the problem is in here, in our hearts, and the solution is up there, at the right hand of the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, even if all it took for you to be blessed was for you to meditate and delight on the law of the Lord for one day, 
but you would still fail. You would still fail because you're a sinner like me. We can't achieve salvation through our efforts. We will fail every time. And so if you read this psalm and see a list of instructions on how to be blessed, you don't have any hope. The psalm would simply spell out eternal destruction for you because you would be the ungodly. Verses 5 and 6 tell us the, the eternal destination for the ungodly. They will not stand in the judgment. Their way will perish. Not only will the wicked and the ungodly not stand. They're going to be destroyed. Destroyed completely. There's no eternal perspective for the wicked. They will be forgotten because they, and all they have done, will perish. But then in verse 6, a new group of people pops up. You see, verse 6, the righteous. Who are these righteous? They're closely connected with the blessed man, but they're not to be confused with the blessed man. This is a plural word. It means a group of people who can be considered righteous. Now, in order to fully understand who these people are, we need to look to Psalm 2. The Psalms are very closely linked. They may even have been one hymn to begin with. The full Psalm then begins with, Blessed is the man, and ends with the line. Look at the end of Psalm 2. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Blessed is the man. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. And so there is blessing to be found here for you and for me. But we receive that blessing not as we might have expected by following a list of instructions. We receive the blessing by putting our trust in the blessed man. And so our question should not be, how can I be blessed? It should be, who is this man? How can I put my trust in him? How can I take refuge in him, is how some verses, versions put it. Well, there's only one man, isn't there? There's only one man who has done all that is described in this psalm, and that's the true man, Jesus of Nazareth. He was born a man and yet did not act the way men do. He didn't desire an earthly kingdom like David or Solomon. He forsook all of that for the sake of the cross. He's the only person ever to live who has truly delighted and meditated on the word of God day and night. It impacted every moment of his life, every decision he made. Jesus is the tree that is planted by streams of water. He yields his fruit in season. He does not wither. All that he does prospers and we should be sheltering under his branches. Jesus is the one in whom we ought to take refuge and the one we should trust. He is the blessed man. We're to be considered righteous before God. If we want to be in this righteous group of people, and we must put our trust in the blessed man of Psalm 1. Folks, this is good news. This is the gospel. It's good news for, for Christians and for non-Christians. It means that our performance is not the ultimate deciding factor in our salvation. We're not justified based on our performance. It is through our union with Christ. It's through our union with Christ that we receive blessing. And are seen as righteous. If we're taking refuge in the truly blessed man, then God looks at us. He no longer sees our sin. He sees his son. And he declares, this is my son. Or daughter, whom I, I love, with whom I am well pleased. And so now we can read back over the first three verses of Psalm 1 and see that it describes us. If we are hiding in Jesus, if we're united to him, these are not obligations that we must fulfill in order to achieve salvation. These are blessings that are given to us through salvation. The qualities described of this blessed man in Psalm 1 are not the price of our salvation, 
They are the prize of our salvation. I'll say that again. They're not the price of our salvation. They are the prize of our salvation. Look again at the language that's used by the psalmist. All this language is descriptive of the blessed man. He doesn't say the blessed man is is blessed because he does this stuff, rather that he does it because he is blessed. You know the old saying, it walks like a duck and, and it quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck. Well, that's how many people read Psalm 1. It's nonsense. If I told you that a lion roars and eats raw meat, that doesn't mean that if you roar and eat raw meat, you're going to become a lion. So let's go back. Let's go back to these verses and see how they apply to those who are trusting in Jesus Christ, the truly blessed man. Look again at verse 1. It seems to imply that we either avoid the wicked or we are the wicked. But the gospel of Jesus Christ presents a third option. We do not need to avoid the world in case we become contaminated by the world. We can enter the world and we bring with us a message of judgment and a message of hope. We can live alongside our non-Christian neighbours, those who are ungodly. We live with such radical, radical difference to them that that their questions about why should be inevitable. We don't have to avoid the ungodly. We live among them. But we live among them as those who are blessed through Christ. What about verse 2? The gospel offers a new way to approach Bible reading. It's not that we have to read and meditate upon the word of God. It's that we get to read and meditate upon the word of God. It's a delight. It's not a chore to read your Bible. If I told you that tomorrow morning you could meet with the Queen because she has an important message for you, well, you would do whatever it takes to hear what she has to say. Friends, we have the pleasure, the pleasure of hearing from God, from the Lord of the universe, every single day. Every moment of every day, we have our Bibles sitting there, and yet we treat it like a chore. This is not a chore. It's a delight. Reading your Bible is not difficult. Some people make it difficult. It's not difficult. Simply read a verse or a few verses every day. Think about them. Ask yourself, pray to God, what does this teach me about Jesus? No one's too busy for that, friends. Finally, look at verse 3. The whole verse is summed up. Whatever he does shall prosper. This has been misused by many parts of the church in many parts of the world. It's been taken to mean that the blessing of God comes to us with health and wealth. It's even known as the prosperity gospel. Well, it's not a gospel because it's not good news. And it's not what the Bible means when it talks about prosperity. In the Bible, prosperity is more about fulfilling our ultimate purpose. And so the tree, that's Christ, fulfills its purpose by bearing fruit, which is establishing the church, and having leaves which don't wither, his word which stands forever. And so for us to share in that blessing is not about health, and wealth. It's about us achieving the purpose for which we were made, that which we were created for, which the Shorter Catechism calls, you're saying it already, our chief end, to glorify God and enjoy him forever, submitting to the rule that he has given us in the scriptures. The blessing we receive in Christ is being able to glorify God, being able to to enjoy him forever. Friends, blessing is not found in keeping a list of instructions. Blessing is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone.
urge you to turn to him today and every day. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we praise you for your word. And we, O oh God, know that we do not delight in your word. We read this description of the blessed man and we say, this is not me. And so we praise you for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the blessed man of Psalm 1. And we put our hope and our trust in you today. We put our hope and our trust in you because only in you do we find blessing. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would unite our hearts to Jesus. That through faith you would give us the ability to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To fulfil that purpose for which we were created. To prosper in all that we do by living out our chief end before you. Our Heavenly Father, we pray today for the church, this congregation of the righteous. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless us and keep us through Jesus. Keep us close to him. Don't let us wander from him. Keep us from temptation. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil is our prayer today. Each one of us knows what it is to walk in sin, what it is to, to live as the ungodly in this passage. And so we pray today, O oh God, that you would cleanse us from unrighteousness, that you would forgive our sins, and that you would assure us that we are blessed not based on our own behaviour or performance, but based on Jesus Christ. We pray also today for all of those in our congregation who are sick or unwell at the present time, either physically or mentally. We pray that you would comfort them and keep them. We pray too for those who have been bereaved in recent months and years, those who are still feeling that burden. We pray, O oh God, that you would watch over them by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with each one of us this day and in the weeks that lie ahead. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to bring our service to a close today by singing another hymn. This is a great old hymn of the faith. Who is the blessed man? Well, it's Jesus the Nazarene. And so we're going to stand and sing together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.